Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so very much for joining us for our seventh Get to Know Your State Forest webinar. Um, we are here today with a forester from Roth Rock State Forest out in central PA. And I am really excited to hear about everything he has to say. Uh, um, my name is Sarah Corcoran. I use she, her pronouns. I am the conservation program manager for the Pennsylvania chapter of the Sierra Club. I'm also the interim deputy director for the chapter. And today's hat is I am the coordinator for Sa the Save Pennsylvania Forest Coalition, which has been partnering to put on these webinars. Uh, all of our webinars are recorded and shared up to our YouTube page. So if you've missed any of the ones that we've done in the past, I will share those out with you afterwards. Um, and we'll be sharing this recording out as well with everyone who is registered. Um, we will be, um, we'll be listening to about a 45 minute presentation today and we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes at the end for uh, questions and answers. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, you can pop them down at the, in the chat window and I will make sure that they are answered at the very end. We're all going to stay on mute throughout the presentation and I'll just read off all of the questions towards the end to make things a little bit more streamlined so we don't have to worry about folks coming on or off mute at the end. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jacob and he can introduce himself. Yes. Yeah. Hello, everyone there. Um, thanks for joining us today here. Uh, talk a little bit about the Roth Rock State Forest and and what we're about here and, and all the different uh, things that are involved here on, on this state forest here. Um, so just a little bit of background information about myself here. Um, so I started my uh, forestry uh, career here with DCNR in, in 2010. Um, started out on the, uh, the forest inventory crew. Um, Worked there for a season collecting uh, forest inventory data uh, with the uh, continuous forest inventory program, um, which is uh, permanent plots throughout uh, the state on state forest land measuring uh, differences in uh, the, the tree growth, tree health, uh, forest stand um, conversion, so forth. Um, and then I, I started here in the Roth Rock as the recreation forester um, there in uh, winter of 2010 um, for about eight years. That involved working with the, uh, the recreational groups and the stakeholders uh, here in, in Roth Rock State Forest, administering that program and the, uh, the, the events that are, are active on our state forest as well. Um, here in about four years ago, I'm, I'm sitting in my, my current role here um, as the, the Huntington County Service Forester. So, so that involves working with uh, private landowners in Huntington County uh, specifically, um, everything from developing uh, forest management plans, uh, offering advice and guidance on uh, forest management and forest health issues. Um, as well as working within the county with uh, riparian buffers, which is um, a, a, a big part of what we do um, in the recent years here. Um, so uh, other duties in the district that I do have, um, I'm the least forced campsite administrator, and I'll get, get into that program uh, here a little bit later in the presentation. Um, also have the, the natural resource management duties, um, everything from uh, laying out timber cells to invasive species uh, mitigation, um, forest health issues, um, wildfire suppression, that, that's, that's part of a forester's job here within DCNR, a Bureau of Forestry. We're tasked with um, you know, the control and suppression of, of wildfires here in the state, um, both on state forest land and on private land. Um, and we do get a lo lot of help with that program from our, uh, our volunteer fire companies there. Um, the GIS and GPS coordinator for the district. So that involves um, 
managing our, our, our databases, uh, any mapping that needs done within the district. Um, you know, I work on that. And then again, within Bureau of Forestry, Foresters, um, and the, the employees here are, are tasked with uh, the search and rescue um, on, uh, on state forest land and, and some on state game lands as well. So we'll move into uh, the presentation outline. Um, so real quick, uh, you know, I'm going to give the, the broad overview of uh, the Bureau of Forestry, the mission, um, our vision, um, how we began, um, and then I'll go into a little bit of the, uh, the state forest system across the state. Um, you know, as, as many of you probably are aware, there's 20 forest districts. Um, so we're one of those, and uh, we're listed as forest district number five. Then I'll, I'll dive a little bit into the history of, of the Roth Rock and, and how we came to be, um, the specific goals and objectives for um, our state forest, and then just the overall forest interest and uh, points of interest within our forests um, in, in the activities uh, based here in the Roth Rock State Forest. So a little bit on the uh, the Bureau of Forestry itself and, and the history there. So in uh, 1895, um, we became a full-time, there was a development of a full-time uh, forestry commission um, established. So, so that commission was tasked with, you know, acquiring land, um, again, wildfire prevention and suppression, um, assisting with you know, the wood industry and the forest products, promoting that, um, as well as working again with private landowners, education, advice, um, you know, all that involved with, uh, you know, that distribution of information there, um, as well as, you know, purpose tax solutions. So the mission um, of, of the Bureau of Forestry, um, again, it's to, to ensure the long-term health, viability, productivity of the Commonwealth's forest and to conserve native wild plants. Um, so as you can see here in the picture, Penn's Woods, um, that's our document um, that has our, um, our long-term strategic plan. Um, so that's the guiding document for DCNR Bureau of Forestry. Um, within that document are based, you know, as the organization, our vision um, as we move forward. Um, and we're currently working on the last leg of um, the update of this plan, which it should be a plan that's updated every 10 to 15 years. It's been um, a little bit longer than that since our last update, but uh, we are on the last leg here. We're doing internal um, draft reviews and comment periods. Um, there a few years ago, we had a comment period with the public um, for that strategic plan. So things are moving forward and I'm optimistic here. Um, you know, here maybe in, in 2023, we'll have our, our final document. So accomplishing the mission of DCNR and Bureau of Forestry. Um, so we're managing state forests under you know, sound ecosystem management. We're looking at forest communities as a whole, um, maintaining biological diversity, uh, wild character of those forests um, with conservation in mind um, and sound um, ecosystem management. You know, providing pure water, a lot of our forests are um, contain those headwaters for, for many of the streams here and, and rivers um, as well. Um, you know, providing for low density rec recreation, which, which nowadays we're seeing a lot more impact um, from the recreational uh, stakeholders. And so we're looking to uh, focus a little bit more um, on providing those opportunities um, you know, at a higher level habitats for, for forest plants and animals. Um, you know, that involves looking at forest health, 
um, creating those conditions that are, are going to, uh, you know, promote those forest communities, um, specifically for, uh, you know, those plants and animals, um, as well as, you know, you have to have to remember, and I'll touch on this, this is a working forest. Um, we have a lot of, of acreage and we're, we're providing uh, wood products, um, you know, for, for that industry that, that we all utilize. Um, so, so that's an important part as well, you know, within our state forest system. Um, and then the, the sound utilization of, of mineral resources here. So this is an overview of, of the state here and just the location of the, the 20 forest districts. Um, you can see where the Roth Rock is located. Um, so it's, it's, it's real close to the center of the state. You know, it's within Huntington Center and Mifflin County is there. Um, so State College um, is within our forest district um, area. So the outlined at area here, State College sits about um, right here in this location. So it's, it's really close to our state forest. So um, that community, you know, we see um, a lot of activity towards that end of the state forest. So we lie within the, the Ridge and Valley uh, province here. Um, you can see on the, the, the graph to the, the left there, um, just about where we're located um, within that ridge and valley. So, so that is, um, you know, an image of that is you have these long ridges running, uh, you know, southwest to, to, to northeast, um, some of them pretty narrow top ridges, um, you know, ranging, you know, 2,000 to, to, to 2,400 feet there. Um, so you have those long narrow ridges and you have these wide fertile valleys. Um, you know, one of the valleys just south of, of Huntington here throughout uh, Belleville is named, you know, Big Valley. Um, so referring to that, so you have these valleys um, where mainly they're used for, you know, agriculture. Um, that's where the communities are, you know, the houses, and then you have these long, um, ridges, steep slopes, rocky terrain. So I'm sure some of you have seen photos of, of this, of, of this type here um, in other presentations, you know, it, it's the basic history of Pennsylvania, um, you know, in the, the 1800s and in early 1900s. Um, you know, it's, it's not a, not a history. It's a kind of a black eye on, on Pennsylvania, but this is, this is part of it, um, due to the, the lumber air, um, you know, iron furnaces, uh, the railroads, all of, you know, the, the late 1800s, um, to the, the early, early 1900s, um, I just want to touch a little bit because specifically in our state forest, there, there's a lot of connection to the, the iron furnaces. Um, you know, to, to speak on, on three of them, reference three of them, you know, Greenwood Furnace, um, if you're familiar with the, the state park out there, um, Paradise Furnace, which is down closer towards our, our Trough Creek Division, um, towards the, the southern part of Huntington County. Um, and then PA furnace um, as well. So, um, you know, a lot, a lot of the, the, the forest looked like this, um, again, to the, the production of lumber as well as the production of charcoal for these furnaces. Um, so, for an example, Greenwood Furnace, um, it was in production from 1834 to 1904. Um, so that's a long running uh, furnace there. Uh, production of, of high quality um, iron there um, into there were uh, charcoal furnaces um, at that time. So to produce that charcoal to use in these furnaces, uh, it was approximately um, you know 330 acres per year. Um, 
So it was active for 70 plus years. Um, so that's, that's quite a bit of acres um, where basically the picture images here are, are what the forest looked like um, during that time period to produce that charcoal um, for those furnaces. So Diamond Valley Railroad. Um, we have an area in our forest where we refer to Diamond Valley. Um, you know, some of our roads are our state forest road system there that are open to the public. Uh, Tram Road, Mule Road, um, Diamond Valley Road. Uh, you know, they're all referenced to to the railroad that, that was there um, and active. You know, in the mid 1800s there. Um, again, uh, to extract the, the resources on the land. Um, and later, you know, as, as uh, carriers for, um, you know, you can see here uh, several gentlemen there, you know, taking a ride on, on this, uh, the railroad there to, you know, explore into the forest. Okay, so, so this image here, um, is is termed as the, the Pennsylvania desert. So again, this is something that was, you know, hit most of Pennsylvania. Um, you know, th this was was a, a common Im image. Um, you know, with the uh, the cuts for again the lumber industry, charcoal. Um, you know, it was just an image across Pennsylvania. You know, it it, it reached a historic low. Uh, Destructive wildfires, you know, ran through these areas, um, as well as the streams, just full full of sediment. So um, that's again part of our history. Um, this was, you know, in the 1900s here, and this is what really, you know, kicked off the the forest conservation movement. Um, so here are are, are two gentlemen. Um, many of you may, may already know um, Joseph P. Rothrock and, and Gifford Pinchell. Um, so our forest, our state forest specifically, you know, is named after uh, Dr. Rothrock there. He was born in McVeigh Town, uh, Mifflin County, which isn't far from um, our district office, just south, south of our district office here. Um, Rothrock, he was, he was a botanist, a physician, a Union soldier, um, and he was appointed, you know, the first commissioner of forestry in 1895. Um, and in, in Pennsylvania, that was really the beginning of, you know, the conservation movement and the beginning of acquiring uh, these denuded forests, you know, into a, a state forest system. Um, obviously, he, he's the father of forestry, known as the father of forestry in Pennsylvania because of this. Um, the large land acquisitions, you know, from the lumber companies, um, and he and he really was a played a significant role in um, you know protecting headwater streams and the development of you know our state forest system. Um, and Gifford Pinchell, um, he was a forester and, and politician, the twenty eighth governor of Pennsylvania here, um, and he had a vision you know with conservation in mind, um, you know not only in Pennsylvania but you know, across the nation here. Um, he was the first chief of the U.S. Forest Service. Um, so he was really a leader, again, you know, across the United States here for um, develop, developing and with conservation in mind, um, putting together these, these national forests as well as, you know, the state forest system. Um, and really looking at, you know, approach, a sustainable approach uh, to forest management. Okay, many of you may have seen this uh, somewhat famous photo here. Um, again, this is uh, Dr. Rothrock at um, Pulpit Rock. Um, so, so this rock is, is located, this image was taken in Franklin County. So it's actually located on Michaud State Forest. Um, so he's overlooking um, an area um, which is close to the Mount Alto campus. Um, if you're familiar with that area, um, there's actually you know a hiking trail in Michaud State Forest.
that that takes you out close to this rock um, and you can get an image of uh, when this photo was taken. I believe it was um, right around 1917 um, when the photo was taken um, in there with uh, his uh, trusty dog uh, rabbit. So just a, just a, a tidbit there on, on that image, which is a common image that we see around um, when we talk about forestry in Pennsylvania. Okay, so then the, the 1930s hit, and that was the beginning of the, uh, the CCC days. Um, so it, it was a program put together, um, you know, during the Great, Great Depression um, by Franklin Roosevelt there, and uh, it provided like a work relief for the, these young men, um, gave them, you know, it, minimal pay, but it put them to work. Um, it fed them, it housed them, um, it, you know, it took them off the streets and introduced, introduced them to different skills that they could gain. Um, everything from forestry to masonry, um, you know, the list goes on there. Um, and, and they're referred to as Roosevelt's tree army. Um, so not only because of, you know, them working within our, our, our state force, but also, um, you know, the, the reforest effort the reforestation efforts um, that came from, um, you know, the CCC program. Um, you know, responsible from, like I said, tree planting, uh, road and trail construction, forced infrastructure needs, um, pavilions, picnic areas, fire prevention. Um, you know, th there's still a lot of features within our state forest today um, that were created, you know, by the CCCs. Um, a lot of the masonry work that you see, even culverts, um, a lot of a lot of uh, chimney stacks that are that are located at our pavilions within our state force. Um, you know, they were all all up. You know, all that work was completed by by this group of, of individuals here. So this is a quick image, um, just as reference from for uh, the CCC camps throughout Pennsylvania here. Um, you can see I've outlined in blue there, circled in blue, some of the camps um, associated with, um, within our state forest or, or close to our state forest land. Okay, I'm gonna, gonna touch a little bit on um, our state forest land in particular here um, and across uh, the state here. So you can see in the dark green, um, that's the location of the, uh, the state forest you know, across Pennsylvania. Um, you can see in the north central area is where we have the, the, the most uh, mass of, of land there. Um, Sproul State Forest, just north of us, has uh, has the most acreage in terms of of state forest, um, and then you can see see ours, um, the Roth Roth State Forest there, string string across uh, Tussie Ridge there, um, fairly narrow um, and long, um, approximately running from if you're familiar with uh, the area, the, the town of Alexandria. Uh, stretching out across uh, Spruce Creek, um, covering uh, just north of Petersburg, and then out to uh, 322, route, route 322, which is the dividing line between uh, Bald Eagle State Forest and Roth Rock State Forest. So all in all, uh, for state forest land in Pennsylvania, uh, approximately 2.2 million acres. Um, so state forest land um, accompanies, you know, 13% of forested area in Pennsylvania. Um, Roth Rock State Forest is, you know, we're, we're approaching 98,000 acres. So you'll hear me uh, talk throughout the presentation on acreage um, and acres. So, so if you can envision, um, you know, a football field, that's, that's roughly the size of, 
an acre. Um, just to kind of have a mindset as I, as I move through the presentation. So this is an image of our, our public use map. Um, so just to, just to reference again, um, State College is approximately in this area. Um, you can see all of our state forest land stretching across the ridge top here, um, out towards uh, 322 again, which is the dividing line. Um, and then we do have these, these outlying uh, tracts of, of land um, close to Mount Union here. And then this is our Trough Creek um, division, which is just south of Lake Racetown, um, you can see here. So within our district, um, our staff members here, we're, we're right around 30 uh, staff members. Um, you know, we have uh, the resource management side, um, and then we have an operations and maintenance um, side of, of our district. So the, the resource management side, that includes the, the foresters, um, where we're out there um, managing uh, the natural resources within the state forest. And then you have our operations and maintenance uh, side of our state forest that are um, doing just that. You know, we have, we have over 300 miles of, of roadways um, and I'll touch on that a little bit more, but they, uh, they're very important to, to keep the, the forest accessible to the public and, and keep that infrastructure in place and, and updated. So touch a little bit on recent land acquisitions uh, within the Roth Rock State Forest here. So over the years, there's been quite a few, um, most of them ranging, you know, anywhere from 20 acres to, um, you know, 100 acres in size. But here within the last year or two, we had a pretty significant um, acquisition, that, you know, over, uh, over a thousand acres there are and it's referred to as our dry hollow track um, so that stretches uh, northern Huntingdon um, across into uh, south central county there center county just east of of warriors mark there um, so that was a significant acquisition um, you know both uh, for ecological reasons um, you know, it, it was uh, acquired there. Um, you know, Pennsylvania Game Commission has a Scotia range with it, which is uh, the Barrens habitat. Um, a lot of uh, scrub oak and, and pine habitat. Um, and this is very similar um, community, forest community there. Um, so it gives us the opportunity here to manage it, um, enhance it, protect, um, you know, that Barrens habitat, which is important. Um, you know, it has a network of vernal pools present throughout the property. Um, so we're, we're working at managing those vernal pools, pr protection of those vernal pools. Um, here in 2021, we had a, a wide scale ecological survey assessment, um, you know, as well as forced community typing within that uh, track. Um, so it, it's really, and, and just recently, probably within the last year, you know, we updated the, the boundary. So it is open to the public at this point. Um, and, and there is a, a nice, uh, it's kind of a, a gradual, um, you know, topography type where it's, it's easy for, for hiking and biking. Um, and it does have a network of uh, roads and trails um, already present on the property. So. Um, yeah, I suggest, you know, if you're in that area or have interest um, to take a walk or, or a bike on, uh, on this, this new track of ours. Um, it, it, it has been managed uh, pretty heavily um, as far as timber harvesting um, prior to um, our acquisition. So you'll see a little bit of that. Um, but again, it's, it's, a, it's a working part of our forest here. So I'll touch a little bit here on uh, the state parks located within Rothrock State Forest. 
So um, many of you are aware, but uh, DCNR as an umbrella, um, you know, we have the, the Bureau of Forestry, which the state parks are managed under that. And then we have the Bureau of State Parks. Um, so that the, there, there are two different bureaus under DCNR. Um, so within Roth Rock State Park, we have, you know, the Whipple Dam State Park. Um, so that, that has a beach, um, picnic area, um, fishing, boating. Uh, th th there's no camping though within Whipple Dam State Park. Greenwood Furnace State Park, um, there is um, modern camping available there, a, a beach, a lake. Um, so you do have the swimming and fishing as well. Um, Penn Roosevelt State Park is more of what I'd say a, a primitive state park. Um, there is a, a few pavilions there, picnic tables. Um, and it does have um, pr uh, a primitive camping area. So for, for tent camping, um, some overnight camping, but um, no, no modern facilities located there. Um, Trough Creek State Park. Um, that's within our, our Trough Creek Division uh, towards Southern Hinding County here. Um, and, and that as well has a, a modern uh, campground there um, with the, uh, the Great Trough Creek that, that runs through the park there. Um, a lot of hiking and, and interesting features to see down there. Um, just to speak on one balanced rock, um, if you've ever been down there, definitely uh, recommend on, on hiking that trail and and taking a, a look at that, um, that feature there. Okay, so, so back to uh, Roth Rock State Forest um, here. So we're divided up into divisions. So we have our Stony Point Division, our Whipple Dam Division, Greenwood Furnace and Trough Creek. Um, so again, uh, those are our divisions broke up mainly for our maintenance and operations of state force. Um, so I'll touch a little bit on that. So again, with our maintenance uh, division, we those guys do a little bit of everything. Um, you know, road cleanup, uh, road maintenance, grading roads, placement of stones. Um, you know, each each fall, um, you know, we're, we're blowing leaves. Um, maintenance of of signs and information kiosks, um, the bridges, culverts, um, really it's, it's kind of endless if you can imagine um, on, on close to 98,000 acres. Um, you now again, with 300 plus miles of road, uh, probably over a thousand culverts, um, you know, many, many state forced gates and bridges so those, those guys really stay busy and really um, are at the forefront on, on keeping, you know, our state forest accessible to the public. Okay, so picnic areas within our state forest. So, so we have two designated, um, so Pine Hill picnic area. So that's in our Stony Point division, uh, not far from Petersburg area. Um, again, out in the Diamond Valley area that we, we refer to. Um, and then we have the Allen Seeger picnic area. Um, so both of these picnic areas have, uh, as you can see, these, these uh, pavilions, um, several pavilions at each of the picnic areas. Um, we have facilities there, restroom facilities. Um, these pavilions aren't reservable, so it's kind of a first come, first serve basis, but um, really they don't they're they're kind of underutilized um in my opinion so uh, you know if you are wanting to gather you know go for a picnic with the family i i highly recommend checking out uh, these two areas um you know there's hiking close by um yeah and in particular here at allen seeger and i'll get into that a little bit here Okay, so natural areas and wild areas within our state forest. Um, so these are designated areas set aside to protect, you know, a, a unique or sensitive um, features here on the landscape. Um, they're used to showcase, you know, examples of maybe major forest communities within our state forest. 
um, and, and they're, they're managed differently than, um, you know, our, our, the acres that are listed as, you know, multiple use acres here on state forest. So, so wild areas are generally uh, much more extensive tracts. Um, you know, they can be several hundred acres to several thousand acres in size. Um, and, and they're kind of set aside for their wild character and, um, you know, backcountry experiences and so forth. Whereas our natural areas are managed mostly by nature with very minimal, um, you know, direct human in intervention. Um, and, and the natural areas are more set aside um, you know, to protect those sensitive species, uh, plants, animal communities, um, you know, scenic observation, education, um, research, things of that sort. Um, so that's kind of a difference when you, if you would look at one of our maps here um, and see wild areas compared to natural areas. So here's a table of what we have within Roth Rock State Forest. Um, broken down, you can see between natural areas and wild areas. Um, so in total, uh, you know, 2,714 acres of natural areas compared to, you know, pushing 6,000 acres of wild areas. Um, so I'm going to touch a little bit on, on two wild areas, or I'm sorry, natural areas in particular um, that I want to talk a little bit about, and, and that'd be Alan Seeger natural area and our Bear Meadows natural area. So Alan Seeger, um, you know, that's found just north of Greenwood Furnace State Park, um, located in, in Huntington County. Um, and it's actually named after a famous uh, World War I poet, um, Alan Seeger. Um, you can see on the sign there and, and read a little bit about the, the history of, of who who that gentleman was, um, and, and he's, he's really known for a few poems, but the, the one that is, really stands out is, you know, I have a rendezvous with death, um, which was written there uh, during the, the World War I era. Um, this area protects the, the headwaters of Standing Stone Creek, as well as, you know, contains old growth hemlock, white pine, yellow birch, um, the stream in the area itself, you know, is lined with um, towering rhododendron, um, you know, especially along the, the, the Standing Stone Creek. Um, so it, it's really a, a unique area set aside. Um, and, and if you would ever visit it, um, you, you would definitely see um, what, I'm, what I'm referring to there. So, so around uh, the core of the natural area, we do have a, a a loop trail, a hiking trail. Um, here's some images. Um, you can see Standing Stone Creek there um, lined with uh, the rhododendron. Um, and I definitely highly recommend here, uh, there last week, uh, the, uh, the rhododendron was in, in full bloom. Um, you know, the rhododendron typically blooms, you know, from early July to mid July. Um, in this this trail here is a perfect rep representation um, of j just the beauty of, of that rhododendron and of this natural area. Um, several footbridges, uh, I believe three or four that you'll cross um, back and forth across uh, Stone Creek there. Um, and it's a, it's a really enjoying hike. Um, you're you're kind of meandering through a tunnel again of rhododendron with these, these towering hemlock and white pine all around you. Um, and here's an image of, uh, you can see the, the loop trail um, is this in particular. It, it's only about three quarters of a mile long. It's flat. So it's, it's, it's kind of really the, the perfect hike, you know, especially if you have young kids, um, you know, it's easy accessible. Um, I highly recommend uh, checking this trail out. So moving on to our, our Bear Meadows natural area. So it's approximately 890 acres. Um, and that's in Center County. Um, you know, protects high, it's a, an entire high mountain fen wetland. So um, there's been a, a 
you know, a lot of confusion there and a lot of people uh, calling it a bog, um, the bare meadows bog, but it's actually a, a, a fen. Um, so, and, and the difference there is a sinking creek, which, which the headwaters begins there um, within the Bear Meadows natural area, um, meanders through through the, 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 the natural area and, and out down through our state forest land. So it has a, a continuous flow stream in it um, where a bog does not. A, a bog mainly gets its water um, from precipitation. Um, so that, that Sinking Creek is also known as, as Coffee Creek. Um, Anytime throughout the year, if, if you'd visit that area, that the, the, the creek itself is a uh, very dark coffee tea look. And that's from the, you know, the, the organic um, decomposition um, and the humic layer there that, that's, that's decomposing within that area. Um, two possible name origins. So um, one could have been from, you know, the treeless area of the fen there. Um, being bare, and then the name just convert, con, you know, converting to um, bare, B-A-R, instead of B-A-R-E. Um, and then the, the other uh, could have been possible from the, the, the numerous bears that, that entered the area, um, feeding on, on high bush blueberry, which is, is prevalent. And um, at this time of year, you can see uh, different individuals suiting up to, to kind of muck through uh, the fen there for, for picking blueberries. Um, so again, it's a, a fen wetland community, black spruce, red spruce, high bush blueberry, um, very acidic, rich, uh, sphagnum moss. Um, and it, it is a, it's a reptile and amphibian special protection area. Um, so again, here, here's some images. Um, again, during the fall when the, the foliage is beginning to, to uh, change there, it, it can be a, it, it's a, it's a really um, neat image, you know, especially accessible, you know, the, the, the Bear Meadows Road parallels this natural area and you can look into the bog. Um, so it's very, very scenic, the, the blueberries and the alders um, and so forth. When, when the foliage is changing there um, is, is really a, a neat image. And it, it's actually designated as a national uh, natural landmark. Um, so, so this is located at one of our parking areas there. Um, so, so what is this exactly? So this is um, through the, the natural park, the National Park Service um, designates um, these national natural landmarks, um, you know, set aside for, you know, the value to research protection of sensitive species, um, you know, protecting a, a community, a natural community there. Um, for, for reference, um, so the, the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon um, in, in Tioga State Forest is, is also um, listed as a, a na national natural landmark. Uh, this again also has a, a loop trail that, that um, goes through the natural area. Um, so if you're looking to investigate this area, um, it's, it's approximately about three mile uh, loop trail that's accessible. It can be seasonably wet. Um, and I'll talk about you know, some improvements that we're doing to, to uh, that trail as well. Okay, so district state forest resource management plan. So, so again, referring to our overall arching strategic plan, um, bureau wide, the, then we have our district management plan and that kind of helps us, um, it guides us, it puts uh, the goals and objectives specific um, for our state forest, it helps us communicate, um, disseminate information to the public and the stakeholders. Um, so, so that's at a district level. And again, uh, you know, prioritizes goals for us. Um, it, you know, it's an over, overview of our state force that has history in it. Um, 
our, our mission moving forward, goals and objectives that are important to the state forest here in particular. Um, and it's about a five or 10 year plan that we try to try to follow there. Okay, so as a forester, um, you know, landscape management units, what they are. So, so it divides, you know, our state forest into um, areas that are, that are common to each other, or have common goals and objectives. Um, so within our state forest, we have nine of these landscape management units. Um, you know, it, it, it organizes district plans, improves communications, and it's for, for planning purposes as far as the natural resource in those areas. Um, you know, and, and here's an image of them, um, you know, across our state forest land. So natural resource management, again, our state forest and, and all state forest across the state are working forests. Um, so what does that mean? What's a working forest? Um, so, so that's a forest that, that's managed um, by natural resource professionals. Um, it can be, uh, you know, as you travel through the forest, you may um, see these, these, these areas that are managed through, you know, timber harvesting or, or deer exposure fences, um, herbicide treatments or tree planting, um, even, um, you know, spongy moth, uh, formerly known as gypsy moth, are operation, are spray operations, um, or they may be more, more, uh, you know, subtle, such as you know, buffering stream habitats or um, maintaining our road systems, you know, the, the ditch lines there, um, you know, things of that sort. So, uh, forest management activities, you know, civil cultural treatments, forest products. Um, so forth. And then we have regeneration projects, um, everything from tree planting to fences, um, you know, forced insect and disease management. That's, that's with the ever-changing um, environment, how dynamic it is, um, you know, that's, that's ever-pressing. Um, invasive plants, same thing. Habitat projects for wildlife. Um, we've done uh, quite a few uh, grouse habitat projects here on, on the district, um, as well as in the recent years, we've gotten into uh, stream bank and stream habitat projects. Um, and then again, touching on, on wildfire suppression as you know, the Bureau of Forestry is, is tasked with that mission. So forest products industry. So again, that's an important part of our state forest system. Um, within our district, we typically manage um, 400 to 500 acres of timber sales each year. Um, you know, the saw timber, the pulpwood uh, markets are there. Um, you know, and typically, you know, we lay out these timber sales. We, uh, we tally the trees. We, we, we put together a timber cell prospectus that we send out to the sawmills. Um, and then it's a competitive bid process from there. Um, you know, the, the, the winning bid, you know, is that sawmill that's willing to pay uh, the most for, for the value of the, the timber there. Um, you know, and that timber sale contract is approximately three years. Um, so you may see areas in our state forest that have been marked and sold to these sawmills that may sit for two years. And then, you know, the, the, the last year of the contract um, the buyers will come in and, and remove those trees. So forest regeneration projects. Um, so, so that's a big part of our state forest and what we do here. And, and typically it's, it's site preparation work, um, everything from herbicide treatments um, to, to deer fencing to, um, you see an image here of a, what, what's called um, a Royer project. So it's a forestry mower. So it's basically a skid steer that has a rotating drum uh, mower. Um, and that's used to, uh, for site, site prep, removal of, uh, you know, and grinding of those competing vegetations prior to um, implementing a timber sale. Um, so it, forestry regeneration projects is, is a big part here within our district. 
So a forced insect and disease, um, you know, that's across the state. It's, it's, it seems like it's never ending. Um, you know, we, we have a, a division of forest health um, within Bureau of Forestry um, that help us within district. Um, you know, integrated pest management approach, uh, monitoring, surveying. Um, each year we have a uh, aircraft, aircraft survey defoliation flights. So uh, a staff member um, goes up into the air, surveys the state forest, um, maps out those areas where we, we may be having infestations. Um, it, obviously that the, the list goes on, it seems like it's, it's never ending here. And, and the same goes for invasive plants. Um, just to touch a little bit, um, so our state forest is, is in an, an early detection rapid response program. Um, so we've listed out five of our top species there that, that we really want to try to keep an eye out for. Um, and again, it, it's, it's called that because, you know, we're, we're detecting it hopefully at an early stage prior to, um, you know, the seed production and the establishment of, you know, these specific five, five uh, invasive plants here. You know, other common threats, you know, across our state forest, a, a big one is stilt grass, um, mile a minute, uh, barberry. I mean, you'll see all these and, and we do our best, um, but, you know, the control of these species um, and the mitigation of them, you know, it's, it's very labor intensive. Um, and uh, we do our best to uh, basically manage those, those invasive plants to the best of our ability. Touch a little bit on wildlife planting and habitat projects. Um, again, a lot of our, our, our log landings that are used for, for timber sales are reseeded in um, native seed mixes or pollinator mixes. Um, so, so those become almost you know, permanent opening areas. Um, you can see in some of the photos there, some of them we've expanded into to larger uh, wildlife opening areas and have done uh, specific uh, tree plantings around those edges um, and have seeded them with uh, wildlife mixes. Um, some of these images here, uh, the forest images, um, are, are part of a, a rough grouse project that we're doing um, off of Cool Rain Road. Um, so it's going to be a, a, a checkerboard of these areas where, um, you know, we're going to promote early succession or young forest habitat within this checkerboard approach that every so many years um, we'll keep it in that rotation of young forests for uh, rough grouse habitat. Stream projects. Here's some images that again, like I said, the past couple of years we've been getting into a little bit more of this, partnering with Trout Unlimited, um, youth fly fishing team, um, where we're doing both uh, stream bank stabilization projects as well as in-stream uh, habitat projects. Um, it, other state forests are, are beginning to do this as well, um, where you'll start to see the introduction of uh, woody debris into these, these uh, flat streams to create that structure and habitat for you know, aquatic um, invertebrates and, and fish as well. Again, wildfire suppressions within our district. Um, it, it, we have two standing fire towers. However, uh, they're, they're both out of commission. Um, one of them is the Greenwood Fire Tower um, and another one is Little Flat uh, Fire Tower. Um, both of them are, are accessible to the public as far as hiking back and, and taking a look at these um, kind of remnant uh, relic images of the past um, when they were used, you know, in the mid 1900s and, and built, um, you know, in the early 1900s there. But unfortunately, they, they've they've degraded to a point where, you know, we no longer um, access the towers and, and they're no longer utilized um, for uh, fire detection there on the district. Public outreach, that's a big part, again, of, of what the district does. Um, 
you know, everything from fairs to festivals, um, fire prevention programs. We do have uh, two full-time uh, uh, forest rangers. So, so they're more, you know, the public relations, um, law enforcement within our state forest. Um, but, but yeah, that's, that's a big part of, of, of what our district does. Um, okay, so to touch a little bit here on, on recreation opportunities, um, it, it, it seems endless here, as well as, you know, you see on other state forest land, um, you know, hiking to, to horseback riding to, um, you know, hunting, fishing, snowmobiling. I mean, it, it really is endless um, on state forest land here. Um, in spite of time, um, I'll try to move a little bit quicker here through the slides, but, but camping in state forest. So we have our primitive camping opportunity as well as uh, motorized. Um, so you can see the difference there. Primitive camping, it's more of a back country. You're hiking in, using a tent, uh, staying no more than one night um, at a campsite. You know, no permits required for that. Um, we're motorized camping. So across our district, we have, we have eight eight motorized sites so um, here's the location of those um, you can see they're designated with these orange triangles um, so again we have eight of them across their state forest um, they're reservable uh, 90 days in advance no charge and, and they're more of you know you're towing a camper or have an rv um, you can use tents on them as well but they're, they're acceptable um, you know with with a camper there an rv so the, the least forced campsites and cabins across our, our district here. Um, so that program began in, in 1913. Um, so it's roughly a, a quarter acre lease area um, that have these cabins. I'm sure if you explore our state forest, uh, you'll see these cabins along our roads. Um, here in Rothrock, we have almost 400 um, of these, these leased campsites um, on a 10 year renewable uh, lease agreement. Okay, so Roth Rock State Forest is really a recreational trail hub. Again, being, being close to State College um, and, and the population there, we, we see a lot of activity. Um, we have our, our local hiking trails, long distance state forest trails, um, shared use trails, snowmobile trails. Um, again, and, and then they're designated with trail blazes, as you can see the different colors there. So just to touch on two of the long distance uh, backcountry trails that we have um, on the Roth Rock here. So we have the, the Mid-State Trail, um, which there's 56 miles here on the Roth Rock of the total 327 miles of the Mid-State. And then the, the Standing Stone Trail as well. Um, 24 miles of that trail crosses the Roth Rock of the, the total 84 miles. Um, and here's some images uh, of those trails here. Uh, Standing Stone Trail and the Hawk Watch. Um, so this is on the, the Allensville uh, Stone Mountain area of, of the Roth Rock. Um, so they, they have uh, the counts there for, for migrating uh, birds of prey there. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's very common, you know, in, in the fall and um, to, to see individuals there do, doing the bird counts um, of, the, of the migrating uh, birds of prey there. Um, and it's a spectacular view as well. A uh, short, short hike, you know, out across the ridge. Um, as you can see, though, it, it's fairly rocky. So um, be prepared to uh, traverse, you know, a rocky trail to get out to this platform, which, you know, is, is open to the public um, there. Okay, so the, the recreation plan for, you know, our state forest. So there in 2018 with Penn State and DCNR in, in cooperation with Applied Trails Research, um, we, have, we had an overall district trail assessment done. Um, so looking at current trail conditions uh, and use, gathering, you know, interest from uh, the stakeholders and, and recreational groups around the area, 
Um, you know, and it gave us a plan moving forward. Um, it was a course of, of two to three years that this plan was developed um, to enhance, you know, user experience, disperse the recreation activity, um, and really create a kind of a long-term uh, vision for our district. You know, looking out 10, 15, 20 years down the road, um, what we could do to enhance recreation opportunities on our district. Um, as well as dispersing those activities, like I said, um, towards the northern end of our district, um, towards the state college end, a, a lot of use in that area, Galbraith Gap, um, Musser Gap, um, some of those areas to, 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 in detail to, to specify those areas and, and looking to disperse um, the, the uses there. Here's a link to the plan, you know, it's, it's viewable by the public. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a very detailed trail plan for the Roth Rock. So trail improvements. So I touched a little bit on the Bear Meadows uh, loop trail there earlier. Um, so that is a hiking only trail as it goes through our natural area. Um, and it's, it's seasonably wet. So we've been working on um, the past year or two um, implementing an, an elevated boardwalk. So with natural materials, uh, locusts, as well as, you know, white oak planks, um, over 800 feet of elevated boardwalk um, around this loop trail. So it's really kind, kind of a neat um, aspect to this trail. Uh, John Wart path. Um, or trail there. It's a shared use trail. You can see it in the middle of the map there. It connects um, loop opportunities. Um, you know, again, uh, it's seasonably wet. You can see uh, that's the sinking creek that parallels um, the John Ward path. And uh, so we're looking at elevating that trail tread. Um, and here's some images, some, some before and after. Um, so, so that project is done there. Um, you know, usage of uh, you know, bringing in shell, uh, we had to use some, some, some geocell fabric there um, to, to keep the material in place and so forth. Um, and, and really with a lot of these trail projects, we rely heavily on, you know, you can see the volunteers working there. We have a very active um, different trail clubs, um, mountain biking, um, clubs there and associations that, that help us um, maintain our trail system. So something new in, in the past couple of years that, that we've been getting into, you know, in, in our district um, specifically is utilizing, um, you know, a small mini excavator and with natural tread, um, you know, machine built trails. Um, you know, both for maintenance as well as implementing, you know, trail relocations and uh, the, the, the construction of new trails. And, and, and why we're kind of going this route, um, topography and soils, you know, it's, it's really rocky. As you can see in these images, um, there's, there's a lot of rock um, on the Roth Rock State Forest. Um, you know, you, you get a better trail quality um, that's you know, less routine maintenance needed on it. Um, you know, the trails, you know, they're built with a machine that, you know, you're getting down to uh, the soils there. You don't have that organic mat. Um, and over time, you know, these trails just, we're seeing less maintenance needed on them. Um, they're, they're, they're more sustainable trails in the long run. Um, and, and here in the last, last year or so, we've been able to add to our staff um, you know, professional trail builder. Um, he's, he's one of our operators here. Um, he, he uses, we have a, a mini excavator to, to build these trails. Um, and again, you know, all the ecological surveys and the clearances, um, you know, the, the historic and archeological uh, surveys are conducted prior to any type of trail construction here. Um, Okay, so, so this is a recent build here. It was a relocation. So um, many of our trails are, are, are fall line trails. So they're, they're old fire breaks. 
Um, they run straight up and down the slope. They're, they're, they're eroded to a point where they're almost impassable. Um, where we're taking a look across the district and, and realigning these trails and doing relocations, you know, across slope um, to better shed the water and to have a more sustainable trail. Um, so here, here's a short video of, uh, this is on our, our Kettle Trail. Um, so it was approximately a quarter mile um, that was put in with, with the machine here and then uh, followed behind with volunteers and trail clubs um, on doing kind of the, the final touches to the trail. And you'll see that in the video. Here. Jake, I, I hate to interrupt. Do you think we can share the video after the fact since I'm looking at the time and it's after one o'clock already? Yeah, yeah, that's sure. Sure, no problem. Yeah, so I, I wanted to watch it too, but I, I wanna be aware of people's time. I know, um, there's been a lot of questions and for those who we can't get through all the questions on, I'll um, send all of those questions over to Jake and he can write up, he can write up answers to all of them um, in, in an email form. So that way we won't, we won't keep you too long today. Um, but I'll go back on mute and let you finish your presentation, Jake. Okay, yeah, sorry. I got short on time here. There's just, there's a lot to talk about in the Roth Rock here. So I'll keep, keep moving on here. Okay, what's in progress? So talking again, Musser Gap trailhead development. Um, and that's approximately, you know, seven and a half mile, miles of trails. Um, you know, the, the, the Musser Gap trailhead is really kind of the gateway um, from, you can see on the map there, State College and the community there a direct access into the state forest land. And we're looking to update that um, with a better trail system um, and, and more accessible. And this is looking out into the future, future um, several years out to, you know, 10 years out potentially, but looking at, you know, uh, 40, 40 miles of trail um, connecting from at the top of the map there, that would be the Musser Gap area all the way into the forest uh, with loop opportunities um, into, uh, you know, the Whipple Dam State Park area. Um, so that, that's all kind of the conceptual vision uh, that again came out of the, the Roth Rock Trail plan. Okay, again, touching on uh, conservation volunteers. Um, you know, we, we rely on them heavy, heavily and they do a fantastic job uh, with trail maintenance um, and, and helping us with our trail projects. And, and, and there's the link there to, to get involved um, with our DCNR uh, conservation volunteer program. All right, so that wraps it up for me. Um, yeah, so sorry I ran over on time there, but I'll try to answer some questions here you may have. Um, there's some follow-up contact information. Um, you know, you can always send an email there uh, to our district email, and then it can get forwarded to uh, myself there. So go ahead, Sarah, there. All right. So like I said, there are quite a few questions. Um, some of them look like they're out of district questions, so I'll hold off on those and answer them individually. Uh, after this presentation, so um, if you have a if you had a question that was not, not within Roth Rock, I'll I'll do my best to answer those at another time. Um, we our first question was wondering if you had much involvement with um, Penn State since you're so close to State College. So yeah, just to touch on that, yeah, there is research projects in district um, that are handled by Penn State. Um, but, but really, um, so those research agreements uh, are, are handled by Penn State. Our, our involvement on implementing those, those research um, projects are, are, are pretty minimal unless, you know, we have a high interest in being involved. But um, yeah, with Penn State University being close by, um, they, they do implement uh, different projects, research um, on Roth Rock State Forest. 
the next question you answered part of it with how many acres are leased for timbering every year within the forest district but um they were wondering about what percentage of that um does that represent so i, I don't know off the top of my head percentage but again um so we manage uh, you know for, for for timber production um or, or for timber sales approximately you know 400 to 500 acres annually are put out for timber sales. Um, again, you know, those that goes through a bid process, the sawmills uh, buy the timber, and then, you know, it's under contract that they come in and, and cut those trees. Um, again, th this is all through, you know, civil cultural prescriptions um, and, you know, the survey of those areas that we do, um, you know, what type of treatment that we put on the ground there, whether it's, you know, overstory removals or shelter woods um, to, uh, you know, an intermediate cut to, you know, buffer treatments as well. But yeah, so on our district annually, about four to 500 acres are cut. Our next question is um, with the narrow width of Rod Rock, with the narrow width of Roth Rocks Forest, is it conducive to a decent amount of wildlife habitat? So certain areas, um, so the, the way our, our forest stretches out across the, the ridge top there, specifically out towards the, the western end of our forest, um, you know, th there's a lot of agriculture, like I said, in the valleys on either side of those ridges. Um, so obviously that, that there's a lot of speaking to, you know, bear and deer, turkey, you know, that they utilize those valleys. Um, as well as, you know, move into the forest. Um, so habitat work um, are, are more towards, um, I wanna say towards the Eastern end of our district, Northeast end where, where we do have some, some you know, valleys that, that we utilize um, for those projects. But yeah, mainly out across the ridge tops, it is so rocky, uh, steep terrain where, you know, accessibility is very limited. The next question I might be able to answer a little bit of because it's more statewide. Uh, it was asking about with the new funding and the budget um, earmarked, is there uh, money earmarked for more forest expansion of the state forest land? Um, I know that part of the money that was earmarked is going to be used to creating uh, a few new state parks within the Commonwealth, but I'm not exactly sure as far as expansion of forest land goes. Do you have any sort of ideas on that? Yeah, I don't, I don't have a whole lot to add to that. Um, I know we work a lot with different uh, conservancy agencies. Um, you know, on acquiring property, whether they, you know, through fundraising and so forth, acquire those, those properties or, and then, you know, it's kind of transferred into our management or part of the state forest. Um, so that I do know, we work with other uh, conservation agencies there, uh, nonprofit organizations and so forth. And then, you know, the land is eventually transferred um, under state forest land. Uh, the next three questions have to do with biological um, impact. So first one is asking if fungal diversity has ever been surveyed within the forest district? Um, not to my knowledge. Um, I can't, can't speak on that. Um, All right. Um, the next one is, um, what, uh, ha so speaking about vernal pools and wondering if there are any particular projects that are uh, geared towards the significance of vernal pools within the state forest. Yeah, so within, within DC and our Bureau of Forestry, we have our ecological section. So, so they're more tasked with um, specific details regarding like vernal pool management. Um, I know that section is working on um, a document, um, a guiding document on managing vernal pools and, and enhancing them as well. Um, but I, I know within that section, they do um, survey particular vernal pools um, and look at, look at ways on enhancing those and protecting them. 
The next question is about impacts from emerald ash borer and spotted lanternfly, and if you've seen uh, any pronounced impacts from either of those species. Yeah, so with the em emerald ash borer, you know, that, that kind of came through our area of the state in a wave um, approximately, you know, 15 years ago. Um, significant impacts, not so much interior forest as we don't have a, a whole lot of uh, forest communities that have a significant component of white ash, um, but um, along our, the edges and some streams, um, along, you know, within the valleys that are, that are just outside of state forest land, uh, significantly impacted by, you know, the emerald ash borer, and, um, you know, the ash, ash trees being uh, killed there. Um, and in the in the spotter and lantern fly, so um, you know we are within you know quarantine area, um, you know. But again, that that that's handled by the uh, Pennsylvania Department of Ag, um, you know. And, and significant impacts interior interior forest, um, I, I don't see it. So um, you know that is a, a nuisance and agricultural pest. You know more towards the vineyards and orchards. Um, hops is another one that it impacts. Um, so it, it really is, um, you know, an agricultural pest as well as you'll see some, some dieback, you know, along forced edges and so forth. Um, but as far as it having a, a very significant impact on forced communities, um, I don't think uh, we'll see that with spotter and lantern. The next question is, if you don't use the fire towers, what fire detection methods do you use? So, yeah, so this day and age, you have to think, you know, those towers were, were active in the, the early 1900s. Uh, again, this day and age with so, cell phones, um, the, the amount of people that are on our state forests, you know, the, the vistas we have that, that you can see out across much of you know, our state force from the top to ridges. Um, you know, we really do, do have already a, a good detection uh, process in, in, in place there. Um, you know, it, everyone has a cell phone. We, we do have aerial detection flights that we can take on, you know, red flag days. We can have staff go up in an aircraft and um, fly around the district. Um, to, to get an early detection if we see fit. Um, but, but really, you know, with the public and the volunteer fire companies um, that are out there on the forest, um, we, we do have a good detection of these fires. Um, and I believe our last question is um, wanting to touch more on wildlife since it wasn't, um, really dug into on this presentation as much. Um, but if there's someone that they can reach out to as far as learning more about the conservation of wildlife species that are happening, that's happening within the district. Yeah, yeah, so again, um, I can pass along here to, to Sarah. Um, our ecological section um, would probably be that, that could better speak on habitat projects in each of the state forests across the state. Um, you know, as well as, you know, the conservation of those species. So um, I'll pass along that, that contact information to maybe reach out to somebody in our ecological section there. All right. Um, we made it through all of the questions. Um, thanks for those who have uh, stuck around for us a little bit late today. Um, I will be sharing out a copy of the recording to everyone who registered. And um, I can share out links to previous recordings as well. And we'll also share out um, any of the links that were added in this presentation. So uh, Jake's contact, which is on that page, a link to the video that we weren't able to watch today, um, and the, um, the link to volunteer uh, within this, the forest district. Um, but yes, so thank you very much for attending our uh, presentation today. And thank you so much, Jake, for taking the time out of your day to tell us a little bit more about Lafra. 
Yeah, thanks everybody. Yeah, I apologize, I ran over there, but definitely check out that uh, trail building uh, video there that Sarah's going to post. Um, it's really interesting, kind of gives a, a good image of, of kind of how we're moving forward with uh, trail development here on the Roth Rock. So yeah, check out that video. It's, it's really neat. All right. Have a good one, everybody.